Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today on the show, author, activist Arundhati Roy debunks the myths surrounding Mahatma Gandhi, and reporter Glenn Greenwald of The Intercept talks about the corporate power behind the national security state. All that and a commentary from me coming up right here on The Laura Flanders Show. India. To a lot of people, all they're familiar with is one person, Mahatma Gandhi. Well, that's not enough as far as our next guest's concerned. Not enough to understand either the nation of India's past or its present. Arundhati Roy is the author of, among other things, The God of Small Things. She's written a new introduction to an 80-year-old book, Annihilation of Caste by B. R. Ambedkar. Here to talk about the new book and the case it makes against the mythology around Gandhi, Arundhati Roy. Arundhati, welcome to the program. Thank you, Laura. Let's start with the text. It's been said that Annihilation of Caste is the most widely read and also the most obscure text in India. What's meant by that? Well, the, the book that you're holding in your hands right now it's uh, an introduction, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually the text of an 80-year-old speech that was never delivered by Dr. Ambedkar, who in India is, you know, a very, very beloved man amongst the, uh, particularly amongst the Dalits who were formerly known as the untouchables. And uh, he, it was a speech uh, that he was supposed to give in 1936 and the organization, which is a sort of privileged caste Hindu reformer outfit, who were at the time proselytizing amongst the uh, Dalits, the untouchables, of course, the opposite of the Hollywood meaning of untouchable, and uh, trying to prevent them from converting to other religions, you know, to escape the scourge of caste. But uh, it was a very political game that was going on at the time. and. They asked Ambedkar to give the text of the speech in advance, and they saw that he was going to use that platform to denounce, indict Hinduism in a very scholarly, erudite way, to indict Hinduism and to exhort un untouchables, I, I use that word because he uses it, uh, to, to convert to other religions. And so they just disinvited him. And this text he published himself in, in, the 19, in 1936. But uh, subsequently, you know, it's the most read because Dalit presses have reproduced it. Mm. The Maharashtra government, uh, you know, initially claimed that it has all the rights to Ambedkar's work, but you can't buy it in a normal bookshop. You know, it's a kind of underground uh, classic, mm. and and it and it shows how there is a kind of lack of. Uh, communication, a complete breakdown of communication be between the privileged caste of India and uh, the others, you know, so, so, so even the books don't. Mm. And, and, and he actually had written it to address a privileged caste audience, and they have kind of invisibilized it. You talk about the invisibilizing of even the debates that took place at that time between Ambedkar and Gandhi. The whole book is not about that, but your introduction touches on it. Can you, for our U.S. audience, just kind of summarize briefly, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the kind of mythology uh, around Mahatma Gandhi. Well, uh, actually, when um, uh, Ambedkar published Annihilation of Caste, you know, he said that he, he wasn't even, I mean, he just considered the Hindu right wing beyond the pale, you know, the kind of people who are in power in India today. So his debate was with those who considered themselves moderate Hindus. And he said 
that a, re a religion, a religion that whose sacred texts sanctified the idea of caste, sanctified this kind of hierarchy, sanctified the idea that you know at the time 44 million and today 100 million people could be considered polluting and impure. He he denounced that religion. He said you cannot be moderate and believe in those texts. Mm. And um, the person who the world believes to be the greatest living Hindu, Mahatma Gandhi, replied, you know, and then Ambedkar replied to that reply, and all that is contained in this book. So when I started to write the introduction, I started looking at this debate. And I, I just began to get really puzzled about the thing. Gandhi was saying that caste is the most genius thing and it was the best part of Hinduism. And, you know, of course, the world thinks that he fought against caste. Right. But he, what he did was he supported caste. But he fought against the idea of untouchability, which was the performative end of caste. So you could keep the structure without the yeah, behavior? Exactly. That he, he didn't question entitlement. He believed that ancestral, because caste is essentially about entitlement mm -hmm. and about ancestral occupation. That, you know, a, a person whose caste says that they should be, uh, you know, what Gandhi kept calling scavengers, who, whose job it is to carry human excreta on their heads, should remain that, should think of it as a divine uh, privilege. And today's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has echoed those words almost exactly. Mm. You describe um, a very complicated relationship, maybe not so complicated, uh, between his theories around caste and his theories around race and his orientation towards the race, the race, racial apartheid system in South Africa. This is stuff that most Americans for sure don't know. It will be distressing for people in the black community who have been taught to valorize him and people on the American left who keep invoking him. But the fact is that all of us, including I, including me, we were taught that you know, Gandhi's political awakening happened when he was thrown out of this whites only compartment in South Africa. On the train. On the train. And in fact, uh, Gandhi believed in racial segregation. His first victory in South Africa was to campaign for a third entrance to be opened in the Durban post office so Indians would not have to use the same entrance as Kafirs. And all my analysis, by the way, is not my analysis. I've just reproduced his own writings mm. and his own. Mm. So there's no interpretation going on here. And he calls them savages and kafirs. And of course, people say, but he changed. But he did not change, mm. you know. Only, uh, I mean, he, 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 he partnered with the British in the Boer War to, to tighten imperialism yeah. in South Africa. He partnered with the British in the, in the very, very brutal put down of the Zulu uprising. He served in the he, military. He served. He, 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 in prison, when he was campaigning later, even his entire life in South Africa, at least 99% of it, was not even campaigning for the rights of the Indian indentured labor who were of the lower caste or the, the subordinate caste, subordinated castes. He was campaigning for the rights of Indian businessmen to be allowed into the Transvaal to compete with British trade. You refer to him as the saint of the status quo. Where did his saintly reputation come from and why is this important to take on now? I mean, you've taken on a lot of controversial topics in your life. Did you need to take on Gandhi? I mean, I really think, how can you, how can you know these things and then allow the idea of in a way, the idea of India, and in a way, he's known as the, I suppose he's the most saintly modern person, you know, invoked all the time. And, and when you see this, is there, a, is there a good time or a bad yeah. time to do it, you know? But the point is that what I was talking, I am talking about is the fact that caste in India, which, I mean, unlike race, unlike apartheid, unlike sexism, unlike e economic imperialism, perhaps we haven't won these battles, but certainly they've come under inter uh, international scrutiny. We talk Whereas about Whereas caste, where, you know, today, uh, um, you know, s in 2012, there was, uh, there was all the protests which the world paid attention to. Good, there was a protest about the 
the, the rape of the gang rape and murder of the girl in the bus in Delhi. But that year, 1,500 Dalit women were raped by upper caste men. That year, 651 Dalits were murdered. You know, many of them lynched. They are still made to eat shit. They are still not allowed, you know, into the, the, the space of, of the so-called privileged castes. So caste has not gone away. Mm. It's, not, it's just that people are associated with Gandhi and yoga and vegetarianism. And underneath that, uh, you know, Indian, even the Indian liberal left-leaning intellectuals have, have invisibilized it. And there has been a very distressing uh, misrepresentation of history by the court historians. You know, and it, it is, it is a, a scandal that's basically hidden in plain sight. You talk about Gandhi's own programs as having disabled, debilitated millions of political imaginations with this bar of purity set so high. Um, can you talk so about that a little low, bit? So actually. Okay, well, <laughs> you know, I mean, talk I think about it's that a little. Um, well, Look, you know, when, when Gandhi was developing the idea of Satyagraha, the soul force as it's known, uh, and when he was, you know, shedding his western suit and putting on the loincloth and eating goat's cheese and all of that, he wasn't actually, uh, the, the, the battles were not for, for the indentured labor or against colonialism. As I said, the battle was to allow Indian business to expand their, Indian traders to expand their home range, you know. But um, what I say is that you cannot simulate poverty. Yeah. Poverty is not about having no money alone. It's about having no power and, and use accumulating power. But look at, uh, look, everyone knows, I mean, because of the Richard Attenborough film, if nothing else, about, about Gandhi's salt march, which was a brilliant piece of political strategy. It, it was a piece of political theater. It was real mass politics. It was, it, was, it was against the salt laws and so on. But three years before that, Ambedkar led what was known as the Mahad Satyagraha, where thousands of untouchables marched through the town of Mahad asking I mean, going militantly to drink from the public water tank where they had been denied all, all yeah. these centuries, you know. Uh, they were beaten and scattered by the, uh, by the privileged castes and Gandhi never supported yeah. that. And the Brahmins pured the tank by pouring cow dung into it, you know. So um, when, we, when, when we talk about political mass action, you know, First of all, we have to be clear about the radicalness yeah. of it, yeah. you know. I mean, mm, what, I, what I talk about in this book is how, how the story of the conflict between uh, uh, Gandhi and Ambedkar actually complicates our understanding of imperialism yeah. and what it meant, you know. For, for Gandhi, it was easy to, to do this rhetoric of, I believe in the people and I don't believe in the state and the people are moral. And Ambedkar was in a wild panic yeah. about the fact that if the British left, the state would be in the hands of the uh, privileged caste Hindus and there would be no safeguards, yeah. you know. So he crossed the line and he lobbied hard to become part of the drafting committee of the constitution to put in some safeguards. He's very nimble in this way, very brilliant. He did, I mean, that does mean he left a, a, a confused legacy. Mm. And Bedkar was ahead of his time on many, many things and I'm thrilled that this book is getting new attention thanks to your introduction and the republication. You mentioned that he believed that the heart of caste was in the control of women. And as people talk about violence against women and the mobilization in India and world, worldwide against it, um, I'd love you to talk about that a little if you could. Or well, watch. Ambedkar, you know, as I, as I sort of briefly mentioned earlier, he, he tried to maneuver himself uh, somehow into 
drafting uh, or being on the drafting committee of the constitution and then you know he was a very brilliant man he studied in Colombia and so he eventually despite his 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 quarrels with the congress party he he became india's first law minister and he tried to draft uh, a, a, a hindu code bill in which uh, you know women were given the right to inheritance to divorce he believed that as you said the control of women was the key to perpetuating the caste system but the parliament was surrounded by sadhus and the hindu right and he was forced to recede he he actually resigned in disgust and it's such a strange thing you know that gandhi should be revered by feminists if you if you look at the things gandhi said and did about women it is beyond shocking sleeping you know? with his niece in his yeah, 70s and i mean much much more than that you know and and so regressive and yet he is valorized and ambedkar of course is unheard of by people outside of india and these things about him even in india people are not aware of you finally are, i believe working on another novel after yes. the tremendous success of god of small things is there anything you can tell us about that no <laughs> 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 no just that i hope you know that i'll be i i i actually uh i actually am so uh so so keen to 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 make the space around myself to finish it because it it's giving me a great deal of pleasure you know good but well, you deserve and some pleasure <laughs> and understand no not that this doesn't <laughs> but i mean it's just sometimes i feel like a sedimentary rock you know like i've had so many layers and layers and layers of uh you know writing this kind of stuff for 15 years now and it, you know a novel isn't about that it's not a manifesto but i feel like it's all uh you know i, I myself am curious about what i will write and 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 how this experience will play out i'm you know? curious too <laughs> and i'm sure our viewers are too aaron dadi as always thank you so much for coming here thank you laura Economic motive is at the center of American war making empire the surveillance state um I think it's something like 75 to 80% of the surveillance budget goes to private corporations so when you talk about surveillance spending it doesn't go into the NSA it goes to Booz Allen and Hamilton or um all of the different uh surveillance corporations around the world um especially in the United States and if you look at even there was a Bloomberg article from 3 days ago that talked about how uh the stock prices of weapons manufacturers what the US media calls defense companies which are weapons manufacturers um are now at an all-time high Raytheon General Dynamics um and Boeing um by virtue of the US bombing campaign in Iraq and Syria which is causing a major increase in the demand for drones and bombs things like the Israeli bombing of Gaza the 50 day bombing of Gaza which is increasing the market the more the US government engages in militarism and aggression and violence the better um these defense companies do the more surveillance they engage in the more the surveillance industry makes um they're all inextricably linked and always have been Well, we've done a lot of reporting on spying that was clearly for economic purposes whether spying on economic summits um or on the Brazilian oil giant Petrobras um there's documents I published in my book where the NSA and hackers within the NSA talk about the motive for spying being not just diplomatic and political power but also economic advantage um there has been reporting on uh spying on the Brazilian Ministry of Mines and Energy by the Canadian um surveillance ag agency that happens to be the agency in Brazil of greatest interest to the Canadian logging industry so there's no question that economic advantage plays a major major role in why the surveillance state has been constructed and how it's used i'd say the story that ended up being um ignored was the very first one that i ever did about the relationship with the, between the NSA and Israel um which is that the NSA turns over enormous amounts of raw unminimized communications data about american citizens to the israeli surveillance agency and in fact the public editor of the new york times criticized her own paper for not reporting the story that we published you can't be an american citizen that cares about what your government is doing in the world without focusing on israel because 
just as an economic matter, the United States gives $3 billion a year of taxpayer money every single year to the Israelis, on top of which they give enormous amounts of diplomatic and other forms of political protection. So everything that Israel does in terms of aggression toward its neighbors is centrally enabled by the United States. So the, my government is responsible for so much of what Israel does in the world. Um, but beyond that, uh, so much of why we are in the Middle East, why we're inextricably involved in the Middle East um, is about Israel, um, but also Israeli aggression towards the people of that region, which is seen quite rightly as American aggression toward the people in that region, um, plays a major role in why there's high levels of anti-American sentiment, why there's um, people who want to do violence to America, which in turn is used to justify um, the endless war there. And so our policy toward Israel is not the only factor, um, but it's one of the major, major factors in why the United States government um, is involved in that region in the destructive ways that it is. When we uh, created the idea of um, a new media organization, which was created in the first instance by myself, Jeremy Scahill, and Laura Poitras, um, diversity, racial, um, ethnic, gender, um, religious diversity was one of our principal goals. We wanted to be the most diverse media organization of its size. Um, when we uh, unveiled ourselves, um, there are a lot of different reasons why, but that was definitely and has been our biggest disappointment and our biggest failure. Um, we made a lot of strides in that regard um, because we're really focused on it, um, but I think the criticism is completely valid. Um, and uh, you know, I think that if you look at uh, where we are now in terms of the journalists and the editors and the other people who are working to produce our journalism, um, it's vastly more diverse than we were seven months ago. Um, and seven months from now, we'll be vastly more diverse still. And I do think that the commitment that we made early on to be the most diverse journalistic outlet for um, our size um, will be one that we will fulfill. The Moral Monday movement came to Missouri this month. What if it spread nationally and to the rest of the week? Police arrested more than 50 people in front of the Ferguson Police Department October 13th during an organized civil disobedience against police killings, including the killing of teenager Michael Brown. More than 60 days after Brown's shooting in August, his shooter, Officer Darren Wilson, had yet to be arrested. That was part of the point, but not all of it. Organizers from across the country planned the action as part of a weekend of resistance inspired by the Moral Monday protests in North Carolina, which started a year ago in protest of right-wing attacks. Among those arrested in Ferguson Monday was Cornell William Brooks, president of the NAACP, and Dr. Cornell West, along with religious leaders of what looked like every faith and gender and race. Critics were quick to call them outside agitators, of course, but there's no getting outside police killings. The actions came as a study by ProPublica revealed that across the states, black teens were about 21 times as likely as their white peers to be shot and killed by cops. And at the same time as the online activist group Color of Change kicked off a campaign to tweet the name of one black police killing victim every hour for the duration of the Ferguson protests. There'll be plenty of names. According to ProPublica, in the seven years leading up to 2012, white officers killed a black person at least twice a week. So what next? The power of the Moral Monday movement has come from its persistence and the breadth of the alliances behind it. Anti-austerity activists teamed up with reproductive rights campaigners and union and religious leaders. They've distinct experiences, but they've made common cause. This mobilization in Missouri has seen some multi-denominational action. Many workers in the St. Louis area fast food campaign, for example, were in the streets protesting the killing of Brown since the first week. Still, it's also true that in our increasingly resegregated nation, too much ignorance continues. Whether it's willful or not is kind of beside the point. On the eve of the protests, white residents in St. Louis told the Washington Post they'd been surprised, even shocked, by the racial divisions exposed since the killing of Michael Brown. Listen, friends don't let friends drink and drive. It's too dangerous. What if white people didn't let our friends live in oblivious privilege? It's just as big a threat. What if every time someone accused the NAACP of sending in outside agitators, we said, there's no getting outside police killings. What if Bill McKibben, who led hundreds of thousands to protest climate injustice in New York, stood up and said, that's me you're talking about. 
We don't have the same experiences, but we can make common cause. And it'll take moral Mondays and Tuesdays and weekends, perhaps. But maybe at the end of it, we'll have a police that's as ready to arrest their own dangerous shooters as they are to arrest Cornell West. Thanks for listening. Write to me. Tell me what you think. Laura at GritTV.org. Thoughts on the Nobel Prizes 2014? Well, look, uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing to talk about because Malala yeah, the, is uh, a brave. Indigenous socialism collectively. Well, this is why uh, native property wasn't recognized because it was collectively owned. They literally put in this, you know, the Dawes Act, the Allotment Act, that, that selfishness had to be created right. for civilization to flourish. So we're talking about, as indigenous peoples, revitalization of a language that was taken away from many of our people.